Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited about tonight's topics. Uh, I'm especially excited to, to uh, introduce to you tonight Shane Klein, who I've known again for a number of years uh, and who just recently won the North Carolina State Competition uh, as, a, as a teacher from Raleigh Charter High School. Uh, so uh, she's been, she's worked with the center as a mentor and at the National Academies for many, many years. Uh, I'm really excited tonight to, uh, to listen to what she has to say about due process clauses. Uh, then I'm going to get into the Equal Protection Clause in session two. Uh, and just a, a shout out to, to Tim Moore. I thought he did a marvelous job last weekend, or last week. I hope you thought so too. So with any further ado, Shane, you're on. All right, thanks, Bob. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the 14th Amendment tonight. And um, before we delve into the due process clause, which is going to be a, a big focus, um, I wanted to kind of uh, preface this with thinking a little bit about um, the history of the passage of the 14th Amendment and uh, how it came to be. Um, and the, the big idea I kind of want us to get out of this first part of tonight is to think about how the 14th Amendment changed the meaning of the Constitution. So, you know, historians often talk about the Civil War as the Second American Revolution, um, but I think it's also helpful to think about the passage of the Civil War Amendments, right, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments um, as the third founding of the United States. And, and this idea comes partly from Will Harris, who's a um, political scientist and professor, um, but also it's the kind of thing that, uh, that historians like to talk about as well. Um, so if we think about the, the first founding as the Declaration and the Articles of Confederation, right, we've got we the states. Um, you had a populace that felt most connected to their state. They didn't travel to other states. They'd been used to being governed by colonial legislatures in the colonial period. The idea of being one nation was new and they were afraid to locate power too far away. So we get this we the states kind of model, right? At the time of the writing of the Constitution, we get the shift, and this is something that Tim talked about um, a bunch next week after the failure of the articles, the shift to we the people. Um, people willing to be um, talking about a united nation um, and a government that directly acts uh, on and for the people, not just the states. But it's also really important for us to remember that, that as our students often bring up to us, right, that everyone is not included. The Constitution protects slavery. It doesn't define citizenship. It leaves these things up to the states. Um, and as a result of, of compromises like the Three-Fifths Clause, um, Southern whites are overrepresented and can continue to use that power to protect slavery, right? Um, if we think about the third founding as the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, right? In the 14th Amendment, we're going to see so many changes, right? National citizenship defined for the first time in the Constitution, and national citizenship will dictate state citizenship. Enormous limits placed on the states under the no state shall part of the 14th Amendment. Um, the purpose of the 14th Amendment is to reign in the states and protect people from state government infringements on their liberty. Um, I think somebody called it Madison's revenge, right, when we were talking last week because of this idea. Yeah, it was Chris. <laughs> um, because of this idea that um, Madison, you know, feared the states and he feared the majority of tyranny that, that, um, that might happen in the states. Um, it's meant to pro provide equal protection. It, in Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, which we'll look at today as well, empowers Congress to make legislation to enforce the provisions of the 14th Amendment. Um, the court hasn't always interpreted this 14th Amendment as broadly as they might have, right? They, they've, they've interpreted it narrowly, and again, we'll talk about that uh, much tonight. But taken on its face, it's a different vision of the Constitution that all people have due process rights, that all citizens have privileges and immunities and that states cannot violate their rights. So it's a, it's a different constitutional vision. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because in week one, when um, I started to think a lot about when Bob presented, he showed us a diagram, right? With tyranny on one end, anarchy on the other. And he talked about how as a nation, we've largely stayed within the good government box in the middle, right? Sometimes we're leaning more towards order, other times leaning more towards liberty, but we're sort of in that box. And I think there's a lot of truth to that statement, but I would posit that that is not the story of America and our constitutional system for a lot of Americans, right? For enslaved people, it's tyranny, right? Um, and I don't think Bob disagrees, but it's, right, for, for people living under Jim Crow, um, for people living with white supremacy and fear of lynching, um, it's tyranny. For women who live under coverture laws, right? It's, 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 not, it's not good government to them, um, you know, et, et cetera. And, I, and I, the reason why I also 
wanted to bring this up is because that first night we talked about how our students and maybe we meant some of us, particularly our students of color, feel that the Constitution isn't for them. Um, and given what I just talked about, you know, they're not wrong. And I, it's not helpful to, to, I think, to tell them they're wrong. Many of their ancestors were not part of we the people. Um, and many of our ancestors were not. Um, and, but it's important to point out that there was the text maybe to argue that they should be part of the we the people, but until we get to this 14th Amendment, they're not included. But the 14th Amendment includes them, right? The 14th Amendment broadens the vision of who the Constitution is for. And so um, I think that's really important for us to keep in mind as we talk about it tonight. And um, to also sort of think about with our students, right? What does, a, what does it mean if we were to fully embrace the, the potential of the 14th Amendment? What is an expansive understanding of the 14th Amendment? Um, and that might change the way our students think about the constitutional system. So um, that's kind of all to, before we start digging into documents, um, I wanted us to try to think about it that way and to think about that tonight. So <laughs> um, let's take a step back and let's start to think about the um, need to pass the 14th Amendment and why Congress um, uh, did feel the need in the aftermath of the Civil War. So one answer is Dred Scott, and I'm going to ask um, Mark to pull up for us um, the excerpts from uh, Dred Scott that I've got there in the documents for tonight. So what I'd love for you all to do is to um, take a minute and to read the um, quotes there from Justice Taney that are um, underneath the red question. And in chat, if you would, um, just briefly to respond to the question, how does the 14th Amendment, um, and you've got a quote there at the bottom, so you know what we're talking about here, how does the 14th Amendment respond to what Justice Taney said in Dred Scott? So, so take a minute and do that. So you guys are talking about how the, the you know, the citizens, um, citizenship is being defined here. Um, and you know, what some recent scholars have, have been saying about, about um, you know, citizenship prior to the 14th Amendment, um, there's a historian named Martha Jones um, out of Johns Hopkins, who's just written a book, where she argues even Justice Taney knew that he was not fully telling the truth, that, that you know, um, African Americans had, had in some courts in some states um, been given, given rights and been treated as citizens in some places. And even in Maryland, where Taney was from, um, African Americans had some claims to courts and things like that. So for him to say and other for Tani to say in other parts of the decision um, that Dred Scott couldn't sue and therefore um, you know wasn't included at all under the under the Constitution um, was was even inaccurate in in Tani's own time, right? Um, and of course, um, I, I think probably I shouldn't say of course, but probably as a lot of folks know, right that. Um, this decision is heavily criticized. Um, it was heavily controversial, uh, even when it was was passed. Um, uh, but it 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 and it was a huge blow to people like Frederick Douglass and abolitionists who were 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 um, you know saw this as an enormous setback to the potential for for rights for African Americans in in free states. Um, so so you know why is the 14th amendment necessary in in 1868 after the 13th dred scott is going to be a big part of that right um so and you all you all sort of got that got that there um so i'm going to ask mark to kind of go over to the powerpoint slide to um he's going to click over there for us um that talks a little bit about um the second side there, yeah, if we scroll down to that. So ratified in 1868, and actually scroll down to John Bingham, I just thought it, we could use a picture. So um, here's the guy who wrote section one of the 14th Amendment. Um, he looks like most 19th century photos of people look, right? A uh, little like <laughs> bug-eyed, um, but let's go on up back to the, to the, to the slide. Thanks, Mark. Um, so ratified in 1868 in the aftermath of the Civil War, it's, it's the radical Republicans' response to, to some, some significant events. So it's a response to Dred Scott, but it's also a response to what's happening on the ground in the South. Um, you know, basically after Lincoln's assassination under the Johnson administration, white Southern Confederates sought to undermine any attempts to reorder the power structure in the South. And they had an ally in Andrew Johnson who was from Tennessee um, it was a Democrat, not a Republican like Lincoln and the radical Republicans. 
Um, and they tried um, to hold on to power despite the death, they tried to hold on power and try to maintain the, power, the existing power structure despite the fact that 620,000 people had just died in the Civil War, right? Um, and they do that in a pretty bold way. They, in the Southern states, go back and elect to Congress you know, the vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens. They elect Confederate office holders um, and they elect uh, people who'd sort of supported secession to Congress, right? Congress won't seat those folks, but they send them to Congress. And so um, the, the Republicans in Congress are uh, feeling like, um, you know, they fought this war and it's not, you know, it's, it, they, they want a new, a new world, a, new, a changed world and, and the Southern states are resisting it. The other really big significant way the Southern states are resisting it is um, the Black Code. So I'm gonna ask Mark to switch over again for us um, to the Mississippi Black Code and some excerpts I have of that for y'all to look at. Okay, so what I'd love for y'all to do, um, maybe it's a little tiny in your screen. We can maybe blow it up and look at the first part first of the Civil Rights of Freedmen excerpts. Thank you. If folks in chat would just say, what do they notice about what Mississippi seems to be doing here? What does this law do? In particular, what do you see going on in section seven as well? When I use this, this document with students, it totally resonates with them to what we've looked at when we've looked at um, at, uh, at, at slave codes and at you know laws that were first establishing race-based slavery that basically put every white person in a, in, in a state like South Carolina uh, in the position of being able to return every black person back to a plantation where they belonged. And, and that's basically what this is saying, right? So if you quit your service of, of your employer um, without good cause, right? Whatever good cause is supposed to mean, any person can bring you back, right? If you leave your labor contract, any person could, could bring you back. So, um, you know, uh, I'm seeing folks saying, you know, taking away rights given to, to, to free blacks, absolutely. So it's, it's actually making things worse for folks that had, had been free, but then um, basically recreating slavery as you guys see. If Mark would scroll down to the vagrant laws, I want to just point out, um, you know, if you didn't think it was bad enough, um, <laughs> they, the, the laws in additionally um, made, uh, made lots of things crimes, right? So um, if you don't, no, sorry, <laughs> if you don't have a job, uh, if you are living on a term of equality with a white person, if you're a vagrant, you're, you're, you're deemed a vagrant. And if you're a vagrant, um, you'll, you'll be fined. And if you're fined and you can't pay your fine, um, if you look towards the bottom of um, section five there, it says, um, uh, let's see, it is hereby made the duty of the sheriff of the proper county to hire out said freedman, free Negro or mulatto to any person who will for the shortest period of service pay said fine and for, for forfeiture and all costs. Um, they're having an auction, right? They're, they're auctioning off prisoners to whoever will, will accept them for the fewest number of days and pay their fine, right? So, um, you know, they're, 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 they're taking this pretty far to basically recreate what they had before the Civil War. So, you know, for, for the radical Republicans writing the 14th Amendment, the gall of, you know, we fought this war, 620,000 people died, 190,000 African-American soldiers fought. And um, this, is what, this is what Mississippi and a lot of other Southern states want to do um, in the immediate aftermath, okay? So, um, Mark, if you would take us to um, section one of the 14th Amendment, which is, I think, the slideshow slide four. Um, go best, John Bingham there. Okay. So here's, you know, they're making change, right? They're saying, look, um, we're, we're substantially, um, you know, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens. States shall not abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens. Um, or make uh, uh, deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process, and deny any person with uh, in its jurisdiction equal protection. So, Bob's going to talk more about equal protection in the next section. Um, but you can see the black codes are going to be gone with that, right? Because the black codes are are aimed at 
um, specific groups of people uh, and not at, not at all citizens. Um, and there's also section five right there that Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of the article. Um, so kind of given that um, basic uh, uh, system of, or the basic setup of, of the passage of the 14th Amendment, I wanna kind of switch gears and, and focus in on, on due process. So um, due process we're gonna talk about in, in two parts. We're gonna talk about procedural due process and we're gonna talk about um, substantive due process. So if we would take a look at the next slide here, which is a cartoon I found um, that I thought was particularly topical for us to look at today. Uh, so if, if anyone has any thoughts about this cartoon, if you would just throw them up in chat, take a minute, take a look at it, and see what you think. What does it have to do with due process? So this is Ted Rall from 2014. Um, yes, this is procedural due process exactly, right? <laughs> um, the idea that uh, that uh, you know, in order when you're deprived of your liberty by the government and uh, life, liberty, or property by the government, um, there are some procedures you're supposed to get, right? Uh, and so, um, Rawl is, of course, um, you know, implying that that's not happening for um, folks in detention is is his implication. So let's let's slip down to the next slide here um, with procedural due process. So, procedural due process is um, the idea that. Um, when government is going to deprive you of your life, liberty, or property, that they have to give you some procedures and before they do that, right? And some of those processes are laid out in the Bill of Rights, like the right to a uh, trial by jury, uh, the right to an attorney. Um, and, and so for criminal cases, um, you, do get a, you do get processes actually laid out in the, in the Bill, Bill of Rights. Um, but you get procedural due process, um, the courts have said, uh, when the government is depriving you of rights, even if it's not in a criminal case. And, and there's a principle that's there that the amount of process depends on the severity of the deprivation of rights. So um, if you would, if throw up in chat, just your first thoughts, what would be a really, what does government do to people that's a, a very large deprivation of their life, liberty, or property? Like what's the, the top three largest deprivations of life, liberty, or property that government can do to people? Yeah, we got jail, right? Everybody's going to Texas, huh? <laughs> Execution, yeah. So, 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 right. So, when we think about when you go, you know, if you're going to be sent to jail for a long period of time, if if you're if if a state that if there is a if for the states that still have the death penalty, if a state is going to execute you, you get a lot of procedures, right? You get a lot of appeals, you get um, you, you get more, more process, right? Um, what would be an example of a government, a minor deprivation of liberty for which you might get, you're not going to get a trial and then a whole bunch of appeals all the way up to the Supreme, you know, guaranteed all the way up to the Supreme Court, potential pardon by the governor like you would for the death penalty. What's, a, what's an example of a very small deprivation of rights? I see some traffic tickets. <laughs> Some of the ones that I like to use with students would be things like um, uh, suspension from school, right? State, the school, the public schools are states um, action. So the, the state is depriving you of, of your right to an education when they suspend you from school. Um, and you get some processes, right? You get at least no, to be notified that you're what you're being suspended for, right? You, you might not get an appeal unless it's a long suspension, but you at least get um, you get some basic uh, uh, notification, right? Um, if government's going to deprive you of um, some of your benefits, um, they have to notify you and give you a reason. So, so there are there are the lowest level of due process is going to be just sort of notice and providing a reason. You know, the highest level would be you know a full blown trial with series of appeals following that. Okay, so. Um, how much uh, how much processes you you get are going to depend. So um, that's that's a that's an uh, an idea that's a little bit easier for students. Those of you who are teachers, for students to understand, right? Because the thing's called due process, and you get some procedures that government's going to provide for you. Um, 
The more complicated, uh, trickier part of due process is substantive due process. Um, the part that's, that's, that some people talk about as an oxymoron, right? How does a process have substance, right? It's where some of the, the criticisms of substantive due process come from. But the idea behind substantive due process is that in Supreme Court cases, the court is choosing to um, define some liberties that people have, taking that phrase um, that you can't be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process, saying, okay, what is that liberty that you can't be deprived of? And, and basically, there's sort of two categories that they have here of substantive due process. Um, one is what we call incorporation, um, and the other is, um, is, is fundamental rights. So I'm going to start with um, incorporation, um, which is the idea that uh, your bill of rights are, your protected, um, your bill of rights rights are protected both against infringements by the federal government, but also through the 14th Amendment against infringements um, by the state government. So if we scroll down, Mark, to the next slide, um, just listed a few, there are a lot more uh, incorporation cases, but cases where the court um, basically started to stay, starting with Gitlow in 1925, look, you, you have protections um, against your state government infringing your rights. And, to, and again, to go back to, to some of the things we were talking about last week, right? Um, when Madison was proposing the Bill of Rights, he wanted an amendment that would have put limits on the states because he, he thought that states obviously had more control over people's right, uh, lives and, and thought they were the, who we should fear. And um, incorporation kind of takes care of some of that and in fact goes probably beyond what Madison um, might have gotten in that first, uh, his first attempt in the, in the Bill of Rights. I'm going to ask Mark to take us to um, the excerpts from Tim's. So um, as I was getting ready to prepare this, um, we actually had a Supreme Court decision come out um, and a new incorporation case, which is um, for those of us, those of you who teach this stuff, um, probably was a pretty exciting uh, moment. We have a new case um, where we have a new right incorporated under the Bill of Rights. So I want to use this as a way to try to understand what is meant by incorporation. Um, so if, um, Mark, you could just blow it up a little bit more. We don't need the last paragraph yet. Um, and I'm going to ask folks to read this over to themselves. And let's just start with um, um, looking at uh, uh, Baron v. Baltimore, okay? So I'm going to work through this together, and then we'll, we'll let you sort of comment on some of the, the text about incorporation. So um, this is from Ginsburg's majority opinion in this case that was decided just recently about... Um, uh, excessive fines in the Eighth Amendment. So she says, when ratified in 1791, the Bill of Rights applied only to the federal government, and her, her citation is Baron v. Baltimore. So the, the case of Baron v. Baltimore in 1833 um, basically had to do with the, the situation where there was Mr. Barron had a, a wharf basically in Baltimore, people docked their boats. The city of Baltimore was, I think they were building a road and they dumped a bunch of dirt in his his wharf and so he could no longer um, make money having people dock their boats there because it had been filled in by all this dirt that the city of baltimore had dumped there and so he said he looked at the bill of rights and he was like whoa right like i've got i've been deprived of my property i can't make money off this anymore i've been deprived of my property and he said um you know we've got this principle of uh of eminent domain in the fifth amendment that says we're going to get just compensation for our, our our property if the government seizes it and in a way government has taken my property i should get some just compensation and this he took his case to the federal courts the supreme court supreme court said nope um sorry mr baron uh you do not win here um because that would, you'd only have a case if the federal government, if the U.S. government had dumped a bunch of dirt <laughs> in, in, in your wharf, but because Baltimore did it, um, you've got no, you've got, you've got no case, okay? So Ginsburg's going all the way back to 1791 in this decision from, you know, like a week ago <laughs> to tell us that the history of incorporation to justify what she's doing, right? So she says, when ratified in 1791, Bill of Rights applied only to the federal government. But since then, okay, the constitutional amendments adopted in the aftermath of, our, of the Civil War fundamentally altered our federal system. It really changed things. Um, and 
with a handful of exceptions, which is becoming an even smaller handful year by year, um, the court has held that the 14th Amendment's due process clause incorporates the protections contained in the Bill of Rights, rendering them uh, applicable to the states. So um, if you could, if you all would, you know, read that last paragraph to yourself, um, what phrases stand out to you about what she's saying about incorporation and how we know, what does incorporation mean? How do we know something's incorporated? What phrases in that last paragraph stand out to you? Yeah, I thought that phrase, no daylight between federal and state conduct was really a helpful way to think about incorporation, right? That, that um, you are really protected um, just in the same way you would be against, against violations by the federal government. Um, yeah, and, and you'll note, some of you are, are pointing out, how do we know something is deeply rooted, right? <laughs> how do we know that something is fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty, right? Um, basically, how do we know that it's important enough to be incorporated? Um, so, so, you know, like with all of, of the things we're going to be talking about for the rest of my session today, um, who gets to decide that, right? The court does. Uh, they, they are the ones who, if they've got five votes, then it's fundamental uh, to our system of ordered liberty. Um, uh, and, and so, so, you know, I'm sure later we'll talk more about, about, um, the power of the court, but, but note they have to make a good argument, right? And one of the things that I think is really important, um, to talk about is, you know, when, when, when arguments, the power of, you have to use the text to make an argument. You can't just make an argument out of nowhere. You've got to use the text to make an argument. You've got to use precedent to make an argument. We'll talk more about precedent in a little bit. Um, and that's what, that's what they're doing here. Um, but, you know, as a result of the Tim's case, right, and recently, and, and you know, just a few years ago now, um, McDonald v. Chicago with the Second Amendment, um, most of the Bill of Rights, very few exceptions to, uh, to the Bill of Rights of what has not been incorporated. Um, so you guys can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think we got the Third Amendment, we got the grand jury provision of the Fifth, um, any, I don't know if anybody has anything else, <laughs> um, but 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 pretty much most everything's been been incorporated at this point. Um, I used to say excessive bail, but I guess I can't anymore, Shane. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we. I think we got the Eighth Amendment fully incorporated now. But and this case, Tim's, um, you know, basically the, the it's about a Land Rover. So uh, <laughs> he uh, his his Land Rover was seized because he he I guess used it for some drug deals, and the 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 court uh, argued that seizing that was an example of an excessive fine. Um, this is this is going to change the way I think uh, a lot of states have to behave in their in their in their seiz fines and forfeitures and seizures policies. Shane uh, Ryan says the Ninth Amendment. I tend to agree with that, but uh, other people may disagree with that. But uh, <clears throat> as far as I know, the Ninth Amendment's never been used uh, solely in a Supreme Court decision. I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Ninth and Tenth. I mean, and then how do you can't incorporate the Tenth, right? So um, uh, we'll talk more about the Tenth Amendment next week when we talk about federalism. Um, but in terms of the yeah, so so nine and ten are no, are no as well. Um, anybody have any other comments or questions about incorporation before we move on? Um, I guess I'd like, uh, I'd like to respond to Tom, uh, Tom's question, or no, Ryan's question about the Ninth Amendment. Um, I think, I, I, I can't help but think that many justices are afraid to incorporate something so, so vague. I mean, it, it's hard enough when you incorporate, it, it seems to be hard enough when you incorporate an actual stated, it's there in black and white. Right, uh, but as, as we all probably know, the Ninth Amendment says like, hey, there's a bunch of other rights you still have. It doesn't really say what they are. So I, I would suspect many justices are, are pretty reticent to incorporate nothing or, or everything because the text really doesn't say anything. Uh, and I, I think many of them would see as a, as a, as a, as a can of worms, maybe, I, I would think. It's, Tim, I, <clears throat> I, I, I think you're right. But in effect, um, the, um, 
substantive due process when it goes beyond the boundaries of the Constitution. In other words, as Shane pointed out, you know, we have these uh, substantive due process cases that incorporated parts of the Bill of Rights, which are there in black and white, right? And then we have cases that uh, aren't uh, in the Bill of Rights that are just considered fundamental rights, where the where five justices, as Shane points out, say that uh, we have this right. Uh, it's, it's implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. It's deeply rooted in our history and traditions. It is fundamental. Uh, therefore, uh, states or the federal government cannot uh, mess with it. Uh, th that's, in essence, substantive due process on that level has become uh, the court's Ninth Amendment. My and so we're, I was gonna say, we're gonna, we're gonna dig into a substantive due process case in just a second, but um, Mark, if you would scroll down to the <clears throat> very bottom of that page that we're looking at right now on Tim's. So this is a little bit um, sort of arguments between law professors, but I, th but I think it's an important thing for us to think about, right? So I was talking earlier about the, the authors of the 14th Amendment, who I, from what I've read, really thought that the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment would be the path by which our rights would be protected. I mean, to them, the definition of what a privileges and immunity of citizenship was, were the things in the Bill of Rights, your right to free speech, your right to bear arms, your right to um, you know, be free from, from invasive searches, uh, unwarranted searches and seizures, those things were your privileges and immunities. And so the question is, you know, students often ask, well, why are, why are we, why is the court doing it this way if that way makes more sense, right? Or it, it goes back to your point about the Ninth Amendment. Why, why aren't we using the Ninth Amendment? But what Akhil Amar says is that the court chose, and I love this phrase, the path of least precedential resistance right? The, it's the path of least resistance, but the path be, where there are fewer precedents in the way and more precedents that help you out. So in talking to students, you know, the, thinking about that, that when the court, um, when the court finds a path, right, that they're going down with precedents, it's easier for them to go down that path because they off, they subscribe to a, a, the principle of, of stare decisis, right? That pre precedents matter and that the, the stability that comes from a, a judicial system that bases itself on precedent, right? And the instability that comes from a judicial system that bounces around a lot. So they could have used the Privileges and Immunities Clause um, probably as the authors of the 14th Amendment intended, but that had sort of been shut down in 1871 really early by the slaughterhouse cases as, a, as not having a whole lot of meaning for people in, in, in bringing suits. And so once they do process clause and the idea of, def, of um, you know, defining the liberties under the due process clause as the Bill of Rights was started with Gitlow in 25, 1925, it was much easier for the court to continue to follow down that path. And I think, Chris, did you want to add something there? You want to? Meet yourself. Um, yeah, I did. I think it's, I, I'm not sure it's the court did it, but I think it's people challenging cases. I figured that was the easiest way. The idea right. of reintroducing privileges and immunities after the slaughterhouse cases, you know, you needed to find another hook on which to hang your hat in the Constitution. And since the court uh, seemed to go with, you know, this substantive due process, that's where you're going to go into the, you know, the, the two different clauses on, in terms of equal protection and due process as opposed to using privileges and immunities. And I think the construction by Bingham is clear that citizens get privileges and immunities, all persons get due process and equal protection. So there is a delineation between citizens and persons within that first part of the 14th Amendment as Bingham uh, wrote the document. So I think uh, a re, you know, a revisit to that privileges and immunities would probably be, uh, it'd be wise, but I don't think that, I'm not sure that the justices have the, uh, the stomach for it. Yeah. And I was, when I was looking at, at the Tim's case for, for putting together this presentation, um, I saw that, I think it's in Clarence Thomas's con concurring opinion in Tim's, he wants, he brings up the privileges and immunities clause. So, um, He's, well, just, just yeah. to throw that in there, if you go back and look at McDonald v. Chicago, uh, Clarence Thomas writes uh, concurrence, and he hangs, he goes with privileges and immunities, but I believe there's a footnote in there that, now that's 2010, right? So yeah. there's a footnote in there that he's worried about this opening the door, and of course, the, the serpent under the table at that time was same-sex marriage, 
And Clarence Thomas does not want to be the justice that opens uh, a different argument for people arguing about the right to same-sex marriage. So he throws that in a footnote in McDonald v. Chicago, but he uses privileges and immunities in that case. So um, that was the perfect segue there, Chris. Thank you, because uh, we're going to look at Obergefell. <laughs> so the next document um, that I want us to look at, actually, before we do that, I'm so sorry, Mark. Um, in the PowerPoint, <laughs> that, that slide, there, there we go, those key sub substantive due process cases. Thank you. So, um, so again, we, we, we talked about how in, under substantive due process, we've got this, this incorporation process, but then we also have these other rights, right, that, that that we've been talking about. This idea that there are other rights that are fundamental um, that the court has decided to protect. Um, and the history of this you know, goes back to 1905 um, with Lochner v. New York, where the court struck down a um, maximum hours law um, that New York had passed to try to protect bakers um, who were working for long hours and breathing in all this flour, I guess, and, 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 and their health was really bad. Um, and um, this was part of the progressive era as a lot of states are starting to pass laws to try to protect workers. Um, they're starting to win and legislatures making their case for, for protecting the rights of workers. And the Supreme Court says, um, no, you know, you, New York, you can't pass that law because if we look at the 14th Amendment, it says no state shall pass any law that deprives um, uh, people with, of life, liberty, or property without due process. And they say that, that people have something called the liberty of contract and that um, government can't get in the way between um, employers and employees negotiating the hours of work. Um, so if people want to work uh, longer hours, um, you know, the, the, the state of New York can't, can't stop them from doing that. Um, and that really started... Um, this idea of defining liberty in the 14th Amendment and, and, and by saying there's this thing called liberty of contract, right? The 14th Amendment doesn't say liberty of contract, it says liberty, but the court started defining, um, defining rights that way. Um, and so that precedent, of, as you probably know, right, we have, you know, we have maximum hours laws, they come during the New Deal, <laughs> that, that, that precedent um, doesn't, doesn't stand long term, um, but the court goes back to substantive due process um, in a lot of cases that have a lot to do with kind of personal autonomy, um, the rights of marriage, um, the rights of privacy within marriage and in relationships. Um, in Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965, which is strikes down a Connecticut law that limited access to birth control, that was for um, married couples in, in Griswold and they talk about the, the rights of privacy in marriage. Um, in Loving v. Virginia, that's both an equal protection case that because it, it, it strikes down a law against interracial marriage in Virginia, but it's also enshrines in, in, as part of substantive due process, this idea of the right to marry and have children. Um, another case in 1990 about um, the right to refuse medical treatment. Um, so the idea that there are some things that are sort of closely guarded rights that have to do with personal autonomy um, Roe is in this, in some ways, in this line of, of cases as well, although the court's really vague in where they're going in the Constitution for Roe. Um, but this right of personal autonomy to make decisions about your body. Okay, so let's um, let's take a look at the Obergefell decision, uh, and this is one of the most recent substantive due process decisions of the court. Okay, so. Um, so I want everyone to take a look at um, the text here, and let's um, let's see. Let's start in that first paragraph. So we see there, where does the court find the right to same-sex marriage in their constitution? And let's. So I'm seeing a lot of it's a due process liberty. We can see that in the first paragraph there, right? Um, uh, and, and, and they frame it as a choice of individual dig dignity and autonomy, um, intimate choices defining personal identity and beliefs um, is, is where they're finding this right. Um, let's see, Mark, would you scroll down so we can see the, the last couple of paragraphs? That's great. Um, so, uh, you know, as you all know, this was a, this was a pretty, um, you know, divisive case and a, and a contested decision. Um, and you can see here, um, 
Justice Kennedy, you know, uh, uh, trying to figure out um, how to sort of, you know, he, 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 he struggles with, he says, you know, history and tradition guide the discipline and inquiry, but they do not set its outer boundaries. So he's, he's trying really, you know, needing to respond to the arguments that were made in the case that, you know, marriage had a certain definition historically, and, and you can't change that definition. He says, when new insight reveals discord between the Constitution's central protections and a received legal stricture, a claim to liberty must be addressed. And then he says, the court has long held the right to marry is protected. Um, and so therefore, um, when assessing whether the force and rationale of its cases apply to same sex couples, the court must respond, uh, must respect the basic reasons why the right to marry has long been protected. And this analysis compels the conclusion that same-sex couples may exercise that same right to marry. Okay, um, so they're 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 relying on cases like um, you know Lawrence v. Texas, uh, which was a, a another case protecting um, protecting gay rights that Kennedy wrote, and then um, relying on Loving and bringing those ideas together and saying this is a substantive due process right. Okay. So um, the last kind of, I think we have about um, five or six minutes left. And the last thing that I really wanted to do um, during the time that I had um, with you all was to try to think about some big questions, right? So um, if, if I really love it if everybody would, would try to jump in on in this in chat in just, just one way or another. Um, let's go back to that big question. How does the 14th Amendment change the meaning of the Constitution? Just give me what what is one you know what is one way that that you think the Fourteenth Amendment has changed the meaning of the Constitution? So I thought um, one. I'm curious if folks have questions about um, any of the topics that that have come up today. So are there specific questions that you have that, that perhaps um, myself or one of the presenters might be able to address or one of the other participants tonight might be able to address? So feel free to, roll, to throw up questions in the chat. Um, but also, um, I, I kind of started with the premise that, that this was a big change and that this was sort of, we can view this as kind of a third founding. This is a new way to look at the entire constitution. Um, and I'm curious if you all agree with that or if, if any, and if anyone would like to, we've, we can open it up to, to general conversation if anyone um, wants to um, might unmute themselves and just share their thoughts about that big, that, big, that big idea that I started with and that big question. So Justin's got a question about um, how to introduce um, substantive due process to students. Um, and I, I mean, I, try to talk about this idea of um, the substance of liberty, right? This, what is, it's an oxymoron of substance of process, but what is the substance of liberty? What does liberty mean in the 14th Amendment? Um, and then I, then I do the two paths that I talked about tonight, right? Which is, it, it means th these Bill of Rights rights through incorporation, and then it means these, uh, these, other, these other rights as well. And I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in on that question. I am sure <laughs> that Tim or Chris or Tommy want to jump in at this point. Okay, I'll take the bait. Is the question <laughs> is the question about how to introduce this uh, this really uh, kind of slippery concept of substantive due process to your students? Well, I usually start off. Uh, I've taught it several times. I usually start off with uh, the due process clause up on the. Board. In fact, I used to start off with it on the chalkboard uh, in the early 90s, but you guys don't have those anymore. And, and, I, and I would say, hey, hey, everyone, I just want you to, we haven't talked about this yet, just tell me what you think this means. And it might take 15 or 20 minutes, but eventually they get around to the idea that Shane talked about earlier, that, well, you know, Vance, government can't take away life, liberty, or property without, you know, fair, fair procedures, you know, fair, they, they have to be fair about that. If they're going to take away that from you, uh, then they've got, they've, got to, they've got to use fair procedures, fair processes. And so we say that, and I say, that's exactly right. 
That's exactly that, what the intention of, of the 14th Amendment due process clause is. And then to introduce a substantive due process, I would take the eraser, all right, and, um, and I would just erase the last part of the clause. And the last part of the clause is uh, without due process of law. So just forget about due process of law. Forget about process for a minute. Substantive due process is government taking away life, liberty, or property. And I also would uh, go on the board and I would insert, I'd use the little insert mark, uh, Bob. I even learned that before I went to Indiana University. And uh, I would insert fundamental life, liberty or property. So government can't take away fundamental life, liberty or property rights, period. Forget about the procedures. They might have passed uh, the law with the fairest of procedures. They might have gone overboard with their procedures, but the law, the effect of the law itself interferes with a life, liberty, a fundamental life, liberty or property interest. Then I blow their minds away. The next question kids have is, well, how do they know if something is a fundamental life, liberty, or property interest? And I say, well, the courts have historically and continue to this day, Shane, uh, thanks to your presentation, have asked two questions to find a fundamental right. Is the right deeply rooted in the history and traditions of our country? And secondly, is the right implicit in the concept of ordered liberty? Now, what the hell do those things mean? Uh, we don't know. Tim Moore doesn't know. John Kaminsky, who knows the founders as friends, doesn't know. Uh, precise. The members of the Supreme Court say that they know, but they don't know. Those are ambiguous, but they are high bars to get over. And then I usually uh, introduce, um, you know, uh, sodomy laws uh, as an example uh, where in 1989 or 90 in Bowers versus Hardwick, the court phrased those questions very specifically. Is the right to engage in homosexual sodomy deeply rooted in the history and traditions of our country? No, it's not. It's not a fundamental right. Is the right to engage in, in homosexual sodomy um, uh, implicit in the concept of ordered liberty? For Pete's sakes, no. But then fast forward, whatever it was, 12 years later in Lawrence versus Texas, the court asks more general questions. The court says, we're searching for a fundamental right, so we're going to ask those same two questions, but we're going to ask them a little differently than we did in Bowers. Is the right to be let alone in the privacy of one's own bedroom deeply rooted in the history and traditions of our country? Yes, it is is the right to be let alone in the privacy of one's own bedroom implicit in the concept of ordered liberty? Yes, it is. Therefore, we have a fundamental right and uh, we're gonna apply strict scrutiny and you know, 99% of the time, we're gonna knock down the state or federal law. And even after that brilliant explanation of substantive due process, 98% of my students still do not know or understand the concept, but that's my best take at it. Thanks, Tom. That was great. <laughs> so, um, the question I would pose with my students, sorry, is just, is the substance of the law fair? I mean, just is the substance of the law fair? Not the, I mean, procedures from the minute they pull you over to the minute the jail door slams behind you or you walk out of court and all the steps and all the procedures that the government must follow and the rights that you have is one thing, but is the substance of the law fair and how is it, and how the law is applied fair? And that's exactly what Tom just explained, right? It, Chris, that's, that's, that's excellent. Is the meaning or the effect of the law inconsistent with a fundamental liberty, property, um, or life interest. Yes. I liked yours, Tommy. That was good. Well, you know, I've been, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've picked up a few, a few tricks, Chris. Well, Bob, are we at, are we at break, I think? Sure. If you want any concluding remarks, uh, Shane, that you'd like to ask before we go? I don't. I, I, I think, um, you know, I think, I think I got it out there. We're good. <laughs> well, let's say, th thanks, Shane, for uh, it's very difficult. I think the hardest part here is 
trying to figure out what to say in, in 55 minutes. Uh, that's always a, a tough thing for a topic like this that folks have been studying their entire lives about and still have questions like Tommy suggested. Uh, that's, you know, I, I think maybe this is one of the areas within the Constitution that most people in America have a hard time with. Uh, and so this was our effort to kind of demystify this, this idea of substantive due process, as well as the differences between that and procedural as well. Uh, let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back uh, for some uh, equal protection stuff. All right, these are 1830 and 1832. Now, I don't necessarily want to go into all of the, uh, the, the, the facts of this particular case, because what I want to focus on is uh, what the end result was in terms of the decision. If you, if you scroll, if you point out down there in the third paragraph, Mark, where it says, domestic dependent nations. Okay, is that right? Okay, yeah, you see that, that Marshall is saying, the framers of the Constitution did not really consider the Indian tribes as foreign nations, but as, de as domestic dependent nations. Now, what this and and then and then and then consequently the Cherokee Nation lacked the standing to sue as a foreign nation, right? Um, go down to the next paragraph and highlight high, up the right there. Okay. This is what Marshall is saying. The relationship of the tribes to the United States resembles that of a ward to its guardian. Justice William Johnson added that the rules of nations would regard Indian tribes as nothing more than wandering hordes held together only by ties of blood and habit and having neither rules nor government beyond what is required in a savage state. Now the problem is with this particular statement is at this time, the Cherokee Nation had a constitution, a written language. Uh, they had a legislative branch, an executive branch to a certain degree, uh, and a judicial branch to a certain degree. So they had sort of taken the lead in what the federal government has been saying, look, you need to act more like civilized people. And what that means is a government of checks and balances uh, and so forth. He's not even acknowledging here that this is the case, which it was. You can find newspapers uh, from this time period of the Cherokee Nation. But the important thing is that Marshall is suggesting they are a domestic dependent nation, dependent upon who? The U.S. government, all right? Uh, there are wards of the court. It's kind of like, to me, it sounds like they're children. They're less than 18 years old and we have to take care of them in some way, all right? That's the attitude that comes out of this particular case. Now, jump to the next one, 1832, Worcester versus Georgia. Okay, scroll, scroll down. The question was, does the state of Georgia have the authority to regulate intercourse between citizens of the state and members of the Cherokee Nation? Here's what Marshall says two years later. No, in an opinion delivered by Marshall, the treaties and laws of the United States contemplate the Indian Tory as completely separated from that of the states and provides all intercourse with them shall be carried exclusively by the government of the Union. The Cherokee Nation then is a distinct community occupying its own territory in which the laws of Georgia can have no force. The whole intercourse between the United States and this nation is by our Constitution and laws vested in the government of the United States. Thus, the Georgia Act uh, that interfered with the federal government's authority was unconstitutional. 
okay, you have, in one case, Marshall saying, we need to take care of these people. They're a ward of the court. Uh, they're not a dependent nation, uh, independent nation. They're sort of, uh, and, and no, uh, uh, they're, they're like children. Now he's saying two years later, no, they, they are uh, uh, independent nations. And they, and not only that, they have to interact with just the federal government and, and the states don't act with, uh, with, with nations. All right. So according to David Wilkins, one of the brightest scholars in Indian law today, suggests that these two cases have put Indian tribes, Indian nations, Native Americans in a precarious position. Because are they a sovereign nation or are they not? Is, if they're sovereign, what does that mean? Do they have treaties with the United States like a nation within a nation? Yes. Are they like France in the middle of America, another nation? Uh, what are they? Well, this has caused since the 1832 confusion, as you can imagine, as court cases have come down over time about how do we treat, uh, how does the federal government, how do we perceive, how do we look at Indian nations across the country? Now, remember what we're talking about is a group of peoples, tribes that occupy the entire United States and now occupy about 3%. Uh, many living in, in Chris's area up in, uh, in North Dakota. Uh, they were moved, the Cherokee obviously were moved west because it, uh, because it got too much for this interaction between uh, the Indian tribe of the Cherokee Nation and the United States and the people of Georgia. Georgia just basically took it over, sent them away, uh, moved them out to Oklahoma, uh, which we all know uh, the story of the, the Trail of Tears. Now, when did Indians, Native Americans, indigenous peoples become citizens of the United States? And why? Well, whether they liked it or not, uh, 1924 with the Snyder Act, all right? Now, what I say that is that I don't want to make any kind of broad strokes across talking about Native Americans. They have different tribal customs, histories, and, and these days, constitutions and bills of rights and, and the discussions like that. So, and I'm not an expert on Indian law, and the more I've learned, the more confusing it gets. I rely a lot on what David, what I've talked to with David Wilkins and others about. He has a concept that I find very interesting. He calls it treble citizenship. He sees Native Americans as citizens of the United States since 1924, citizens of their own tribes, and citizens of the state where, where they reside in. And his joke, sadly to say, is if somebody has that much citizenship, you'd think they'd be the most protected people on earth. But we know that's not the case. So, let's jump to 1968. Would you go to that uh, Civil Rights Act of 68? See at the top, yes. We all talk a lot about the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Acts of 64 and 65. I'm not sure how much this act is, is talked about as well. Now, we might ask why is there an Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968? Why is it, why are they, if, if, if Native Americans became citizens in 1924, well, why do they need a Civil Rights Act of 68? Well, you might ask that same question, why do we need a Voting Rights Act and a, and a, and a Civil Rights Act of 65 or 64? Because things weren't, because again, you know, humans aren't angels and, they violated the rights of individuals all along. Now, how was this prompted? There were a number of tribes and individuals from tribes, not, and, and again, not all, 
Some rejected, some, some Native Americans rejected the idea of this at all. You can't put a Civil Rights Act on us because we're a sovereign nation. Others said, look, we're being violated. Our constitutional rights, because we're citizens since 1924, are being violated by our tribes. And we need a Civil Rights Act to, protect, to help protect us uh, uh, against our own tribes. Because what they're doing on the reservation or uh, within, a, within, a, within a tribe is, a, they think, is a violation of the Constitution, the United States Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Wow. Okay. So let's look at this for a second here. The first part is definitional. Um, look at the constitutional rights. Uh, and I'm going to give you a few minutes to look at this and chat in here on what you see is similar to what we have in the Constitution and or the Bill of Rights uh, or any kind of amendments that we might have. Uh, and then point out, secondly, what do you see as a distinct difference? It's pretty, I think it's pretty straightforward. You can see that there's many protections that we recognize. Do you look at seven for, for, for a minute. What do you notice that's particularly interesting there? When Indian nations are dealing with big time felonies, does this restrict them from those? Tom says, yes. If you can only give a fine of $5,000 and one year in jail, you're not gonna be dealing with murder trials. Guess what? The FBI is coming in. Why? Because they're a dependent nation. They need our help. They're a ward, uh, we're the guardian and they're the ward. You can't really handle these kinds of cases. We need to be involved in, in, in that, all right? Uh, it's kind of like, again, I, I sort of see this as, a teenager. We're going to give you some liberty, but we're not going to cut the lines exactly right because we, we love you and we're your parents. We're going to take care of you. And part of this is we're going to deal with these major crimes. I think it's a slap in the face, but that's my opinion. Um, look at six. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so eight. deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of its laws or deprive any person of liberty or property without due process. We just did that, right? Now we're dealing with what about equal protection? All right, so this is passed in 68. Let's jump to, um, go back to there. Yeah, let's go to the, 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 the facts. All right, I find this case pretty interesting. It's 1978, uh, and what, what you have is, is a woman by the, by the name of Julia Mart Martinez. She's a member of the Santa Clara Pueblo tribe, and she's married to a Navajo Indian. And she's had several children, including the respondent, respondent Audrey Martinez. Two years before the marriage, the Pueblo passed a membership ordinance here at, at issue, which bars admission of Martinez children to the tribe because their father is not a Santa Claran. The Santa Claran Pueblo denied membership to the women's children based on a tribal ordinance excluding the children of female but not male members who married outside the tribe. If I'm a man and I marry outside the tribe, our kids are gonna have all the, the, the benefits of being a Pueblo. If I'm a woman and I marry outside the tribe, uh, guess what? My kids don't have those same uh, uh, liberties or the same uh, benefits uh, from being uh, a Santa Clara Pueblo. So the ordinance excluded children could neither vote, hold secular office, remain on the reservation in the event of the mother's death, 
or inherit the mother's house or interest in communal lands. She, uh, so they brought, they said, look, we're American citizens. Uh, I've read the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. This doesn't sound uh, like this is an equal, uh, the we're getting equal protection. A male can marry outside, but a female cannot. Tribal law. So they sued the tribe, all right? Uh, go down to the constitutional question. Does the tribal ordinance violate the Indian Civil Rights Act of 68, especially that clause we just talked about? Does the tribal ordinance violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment? And can a federal court pass on the validity of an Indian tribe's ordinance denying membership to the children of certain female tribes? Meaning, are Indian nations sovereign nations that can make up their own laws? Or do those laws have to be in line with the Constitution and Bill of Rights, similar to like a state? Obviously, if this was a state uh, uh, issue, uh, the st as crazy as some of the laws uh, you brought up in Mississippi earlier, they certainly couldn't bring up a law that said, if you marry outside of Mississippi, if you're a woman, forget it, and have a different treatment if you're a man and do the same thing. That was never going to fly, all right? But in this case, we have two important precedents in Marshall, which guide us into how we want to uh, think about Indian tribes and their relationship to the federal government and the state governments. One of them is saying they're a dependent nation we need to take care of them. They can't, aren't able to, to deal exclusively on their own. There's an umbilical cord that's still somewhat attached. The other saying in 32, they're a sovereign nation. In fact, states, you, you're not even supposed to wor work with them. Uh, uh, they work with the national government. We have treaties with them. Uh, states don't. Uh, and so, so what is it? Now, this comes down to an individual person who, who thinks is being discriminated, who's, who thinks her, the Equal Protection Clause is being violated because of an Indian law, in this case, the Santa Clara Pueblo. All right. So I want you and in in some groups here that Mark's going to put you in to act as the Supreme Court. You have to decide this case. Which, where are you going to go? You're going to go with Martinez, that this is a violation of her equal protection, or you're going to go with the Pueblo Nation. Uh, uh, we have a law, that's our law, and uh, that should stand, and, and the federal government should stay out of it. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes. Uh, with your, with your, uh, the group leaders, Shane and Tim uh, and Chris and Tommy, uh, to get in there, discuss this, come up with a vote. How are you going to decide, Martinez or the Pueblo Nation? And is that vote unanimous or not? And I'd like a compelling argument why you think what, how you decided. We were group one, right? Correct. Yes. And, and Mark, do, do I have the power to unmute somebody? You do. Well, uh, I think you do. If not, then I will. Well, uh, Kim, right there, I see on my screen, is, uh, is the, uh, wrote the controlling opinion for our group. Yep. So, she did. Um, you, yes, Kim? I did. <laughs> she is so, on behalf of group one, the majority ruled that the 14th Amendment supersedes the Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968. Uh, equal rights for boys and girls, they should be allowed to um, be in the tribe um, either way, boys or girls. There we go. Great. Okay, so uh, group two, Tim, that was your wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry, Mark. I just yeah. got my way. Group one decided which way? 14th Amendment. For Martinez or for the Navajo or for the Pueblo? Uh, Martinez. 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 Yeah, Martinez. Martinez. And, and was it unanimous? 
majority. Four to one. Four to one, okay. Four Martinez, one Pueblo. And just to, to, what was the compelling reason for the majority opinion, unless you're not the majority opinion? Todd, would you like to add that? <laughs> you were really good at that part of it. <coughs> I don't know, was I? Um, well, uh, I think the supremacy clause comes in here big time. Uh, the okay. Civil Rights Act is an act of Congress, in which case the 14th Amendment of the Constitution would override it. Um, I think very often, uh, or in the practicality, the, the tribes, uh, we may call them sovereign entities, but they have been subservient to the federal government for their entire existence. Um, on the reservation. So the practicality is that they are uh, managed by the federal government with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, and then certainly if uh, the FBI is able to have jurisdiction there, uh, the Constitution should uh, sh uh, should apply. Okay, group two. All right, that was Tim, Tim Moore's group. Yes, we, uh, our spokesman is, uh, spokesperson, excuse me, is Tara Lisa. Tara Lisa, you can unmute yourself, or I will if I can find you. iPad. iPad, okay. <laughs> yeah. You're unmuted. Um, we decided that based on the, as it was said, the Wooster decision, that we see that the Pueblos are a sovereign nation. Okay. We have, um, no, there's no congressional power um, for that decision, so we are deciding with the Pueblo. And it was um, unanimous. It was unanimous. How many people was that? Four. Four zero? Well, I, rec I recused oh, myself. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> but, but it was unanimous. Nobody was signing with Martinez that no. she had a case here, right? No, not at all. She, you know, she's a woman, so, the, so, so screw it. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we've, and what we're saying is, unfortunately, because we're looking at them as a sovereign nation, we felt that congressional commentary, that, that Civil Rights Act from um, 68 and the other okay. pieces can't play a part. Because don't, don't necessarily play a part. Okay. Right. And did you look at the, 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 I rushed over it very quickly, but you remember that the law was passed before she got married. Did that come up in your discussion? No. You know, she, you know, she, she walked into that marriage knowing that this was the law. No, we didn't know. We didn't discuss that. Okay. That would help your case though, right? Yeah. That would. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, group three. Okay. That was Shane's group. Let's see. Let me unmute you, Shane. Okay. Um, uh, we were two, one. I'm trying to, does, um, uh, I'm trying to remember who voted which way. I'm sorry, guys. Um, Justin, do you you were with the majority, right? Do you want to say a little bit about why we voted the way we did? I'll unmute you, Justin. You should be unmuted <laughs> now. Uh, there was a, more a question of uh, when the U.S. government might intervene uh, in a tribal scenario. So, um, well, this situation doesn't really deprive anybody of, of life or put anybody in that kind of peril. Uh, we do think that the 14th Amendment should apply. Her kids have to leave the reservation when she dies. Does that deprive any life or liberty? <laughs> <laughs> and I guess the question was, we could imagine scenarios where we would, we would hope to see intervention where someone's life was in jeopardy under tribal law. And we thought this might meet the threshold for when U.S. law and, and the equal protection that we try to provide uh, would flow through to tribal populations. Uh, so you decided with Martinez two to one, correct? Okay, group four. Group four was 4-0 Martinez, but I have to say that I, until, the, until Peg uh, brought up a really good argument, I was for uh, the tribe. Uh, and here's why. Um, you have this history of, of negative relationships between tribal uh, entities and the national or state governments. 
uh, we have this long history of, of uh, abuses, mistreatments, and so forth. And uh, if we really want tribes to be independent and sovereign, then they should themselves uh, look at this law that we all agreed was a violation of equal protection, but let the, let the tribes uh, figure that out for themselves. And how will they ever grow as a governing body if every time something comes up, you know, the United States government steps in? And I was, I was ready to make that argument until Peg burst my bubble and said, well, geez, Mons, uh, how far are you willing to take that? What if the Pueblos were going to castrate people if they did uh, something or, uh, you know, whatever? You can think of whatever. And I had to agree that, yeah, gee, we can't, we can't take it uh, all the way to, uh, uh, to that extreme uh, because, you know, in some sense, we would have a moral, ethical obligation to protect those individuals uh, living under tribal uh, law. But it's constitutional. It's a really tough case, uh, Bob. It is. And, and it is. I, I know. And so what we have here is three courts for Martinez and one court for the Pueblo. Interestingly, that one was 4-0, all right? So there was some disagreement in a couple of other case, courts. You guys want to know what happened? Yes, stay Sensei, tuned. tell us. S stay tuned to next week. No, we're going to do it right <laughs> now, all right? Uh, Mark? Put on the the, uh, the 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 unsecreted document. Okay. All right. It is, it is no longer secret. Okay. Uh, Thorogood Marshall, the civil rights giant, uh, argued Brown versus Board, uh, wrote the majority opinion, and he says this. The Equal Protection Guarantee of the India, Indian Civil Rights Act should not be construed in any, a, in any manner which would require or authorize this court to determine which traditional values will promote cultural survival and should therefore be preserved. Such a determination should be made by the people of the Santa Clara, not only because they can best decide what values are important, but also because they must live with the decision every day. Indian tribes are distinct, independent political communities retaining their original natural rights. Many of you said this in matters of local self-government, and he's, and he's going after, he's using Worcester versus Georgia, the second case to make his point that Marshall's saying they're a sovereign nation. Although no longer possessed of the full attributes of sovereignty, they remain a separate people with the power of regulating their internal and social relations. They have power to make their own substantive law in internal matters and to enforce that law in their own forums. As separate sovereigns pre-existing, as Shane said, the Constitution, tribes have historically been regarded as unconstrained by those constitutional provisions framed specifically as limitations on federal or state authority. All right, he goes on and talks about ICRA. So, Thurgood Marshall reads the majority. This is that the Pueblo win. They're a sovereign nation because of Worcester versus Georgia. Uh, even though they're not completely sovereign, they still have the rights and powers to do what they want within their own specific community. Uh, Professor Lemming, I wanted on uh, record that uh, group two, that would have been our group, uh, was exactly spot on. And it's good to know that John Marshall, <laughs> John Marshall agreed with us. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, I was gonna mention that at the end, right? <laughs> but, but thanks for thanks for chiming in, Tim. You're already told you. Okay. Now there was a dissent in this, and I think it's worth uh, listening to because it again I think articulates what we just discussed with those dissents. The declaring purpose of the Indian Civil Rights Act of '68 is to ensure that the American Indian is afforded the broad constitutional rights secured to all Americans. The court today, by denying a federal forum to Indians who allege that their rights under ICRA have been denied by their tribes, substantially undermines the goal of ICRA 
and the particular frustrates Title I's purpose of protecting individual Indians from arbitrary and unjust actions of tribal governments. Because I believe that implicit within Title I's declaration of constitutional rights is the authorization of an individual Indian to bring civil action in federal court against tribal officials for the declaratory and injunctive relief to enforce those provisions. I dissent. Amen. Powerful argument, I think, Amen. right? Um, I chose this case for a couple of reasons. Mark, you can take that down now, I think. Is one, I, it's pits, it, 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 it pits up important substantive rights of individuals under a government, a Republican government. It's an interesting one that's particularly American because it deals with American Indian tribes. Even if you want to put American on there, are Indian tribes or indigenous peoples that live within our nation. And we, we have uh, the justices, Marshall, uh, going and using this important case uh, that Marshall brought out in 32 as their sovereign nations. And well, they got they got they got to work through this as Tommy and Peg talked about. Maybe they need the power to be able to work through this. Others, others, you might say that this is ridiculous. These, that these women and their children are being penalized by this. I, I think it's a tough case. I think it's an interesting one. And the reason why I wanted to have, in this case, four different courts, because this is, a, this is a, a, another lesson to our own Supreme Court, is who is on the court matters. Reasonable people in this crowd tonight had reasonable disagreements about how this case should go, one way or the other. And we, as also judges of constitutional action, I can make reasonable arguments which way to go. Uh, you know, I, I saw in the frustration of Justin is like, I don't really want to decide this case. I mean, it's too tough. It's, it, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can see it this way and I can see it that way. Well, we, I think, as, as America's acting as judges, need to use this kind of a case that that it's not easy. And I, suge I suspect that many of the cases that we would deal with uh, in civic and government, they're, they're not easy. There's gonna be dissents to them. The one that uh, Shane brought up, interestingly enough, the Thames case was a 9-0 decision, but they reversed the decision of the Indiana Supreme Court. So my first inclination is, well, if the Supreme Court's 9-0, what's the argument of the state of Indiana? I mean, they must have one, and it must be somewhat reasonable because they won in the state of Indi in the state of Indiana. Said, "No, this is not. Leave us alone. You can't tell us what to do." They made the same argument as we're making for the Indian tribe. Leave us alone. You can't tell us what to do. That's what the state was arguing in Thames, and the Supreme Court said, "Nope, we're going over you." In this case, the Supreme Court marshal saying, "Nope." In this case, we're not going to go over you. You're going to, you're going to, you deal with this in the best you way. Um, so uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, I encourage you to, to, if you want to learn more about Indian law, it's very, very complex issue. Not many lawyers out there want to deal with it or know how to deal with it. But Dave, uh, David Wilkins, he's on my, bio, my, my suggested list. Uh, is probably the most well-written these days uh, in Indian law that varies from nation to nation. My most experience has been on the Navajo Nation, where I've done a number of seminars there. Uh, and I'll, le I'll leave you with this. First of all, this is not a broad stroke among uh, Navajos, and certainly not a broad stroke among Native Americans. But I was touring a, a school on the, na on the nation in the Indian nation of the, of the Navajos. And the principal turned to me and said, why do you, uh, see, they, they consider everybody that's not a Navajo a non-Navajo. She basically said, why do you white people, but she read it in the nicest of ways, uh, worry about 
um, sports logos, in particular the Washington Redskins. She said, we were <coughs> about national sovereignty or st nation sovereignty, uranium rights that the federal government's dealing with is poverty and crime. We're not really concerned about what sports teams have, uh, have out there. Now, there are lots of Native Americans who are very objective about the Washington Redskins logo, all right? And they have a right to object to that. I'm, I was kind of taken back that she brought this up to me, that if you're really concerned about Native Americans, that's not the issue to, to fall on the sword for. There's much bigger issues to deal with than what sports logos are. That was her opinion. To, to me. And here's, I visited a school, another school in Sanders, Arizona, that has, and you can look this up on their website as well as the Washington Redskins sites, they have basically the same image. It's, it's technically the very same. I don't know what that means. I'm just saying that if, you, if you're concerned about the lives of Native Americans in this country, that may be not an issue that you wanna spend a whole lot of time on and really deal with some of the things that Chris Kavanaugh is dealing with up there in North, in North Dakota uh, and the issues of, of, of their own sovereignty, how do the states treat them and how does the federal government treat them? What do they expect from us? Uh, uh, and, what, what, and, what can, and, and what's the future of, the, of these people? I will tell you this, the Navajos were reduced to about 10,000 people, these are estimates, in 1861 when they signed the peace treaty with the United States. They have expanded to over 300,000 people since then. Approximately 200,000 living on the Navajo Nation reservation and 100,000 living off the nation. They have, unlike other nations, Indian tribes who have dwizzled away, have, have left us, languages have left us, they have prospered, and, I, I, and the question is how and why and what are they doing there in terms of having a government? They resisted, there was an effort in the United States to force nations, Indian nations, to write constitutions. They said no, Navajos did. They do have a Bill of Rights. Look it up. There's one big difference. They have a statement about the importance of women on the tribe because it's a matriarchal system and they wanted that in that document. So you can see it uh, in terms of how they, they, they pinpoint uh, the importance of women in their physical document, in their, in their Bill of Rights. They have a president or a governor, a president, they have a legislative branch and they have a Supreme Court. Uh, I would encourage all of you to, to visit Indian nations around the, around the country. I'm most familiar with the Navajo. It's large, it's the size of West Virginia. See what has become of Indians today, the Navajos. What can we do to do a better job of teaching about uh, Indian tribes in our schools? And I'm afraid that the problem with that is that lots of teachers are scared. They don't know what to say. They're afraid to say the wrong thing. My, I want to leave you with, because we have one minute left here, I hope that this encourages you to reach out and learn more about what's happening to, uh, to Indian tribes in the United States. And this case is a, was one that we can, we, can, uh, a, we, we can have a connection between the Constitution and Indian sovereignty and, Indian, and the nationhood of, of Indian tribes. Um, next week, Shane is on again with, with one of my favorite topics, and that's federalism, all right? And you know, if you look at America, uh, if you look at flags, country flags around the world, go, on, go pull that up online and see uh, flags from around the world. What's interesting about the United States flag to me is that it, it has 50 things on there, stars. Does that represent in itself the idea of federalism, that it's a country and states. You don't see that kind of a reflection on many country flags around the world. It stands out, it seems to me, within the United States flag. 
That idea that I started off with the first night of not only do we separate power this way by separation of, 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 of branches, but we separate power this way between a national level, state, and local. We disperse power again this way. That's the one, some people say the genius of the American system, and others around the world don't understand it. Uh, sometimes Americans don't understand it. A, a, a most important topic, federalism, that's gonna be next week uh, on the first session. The second session is Chris Kavanaugh is gonna join us for the first time, and he's gonna deal with, uh, of all things, uh, the power of the executive. Now, I might remind you that that particular unit, unit four, is federalism, the Supreme Court, Congress, and the presidency. Within 55 minutes, Chris has decided, I think wisely, to concentrate pretty much on <clears throat> the executive. Although there's an interplay, obviously. When is the president be checked by the Congress and back and forth? That's gonna be very exciting, especially, and I hate to say it, in these times. I would say in all times, it's important to know the powers of the executive branch. Are they expanded or not expanded? What do we want out of a presidency? The founders had little idea about it. They knew they didn't want a king. Look at article uh, uh, two, it's very limited, right? They know we don't want a king, but what is it gonna be? Well, we have now 200 and some 50 years, 40 years of, of, of tradition of that. Chris is gonna concentrate on that next week. I, I can't wait to, to, to hear that as well. So with that, folks, thanks so much for, for being involved uh, tonight. Again, let's thank uh, Shane uh, one more time. And uh, um, keep, keep the faith.